Hello, my name is Bob Morrison and I'm the CEO of Quadrant Research. Today I'm sharing with you an interview that I conducted with the legendary Congressman John Lewis in late January of 2017. It was inspired by a speech that Congressman Lewis gave in May of 2015 where he was receiving NAM's Support Music Award for his support of music education in the United States. During the award ceremony, Congressman Lewis closed with this now famous statement, without music, the civil rights movement would have been like a bird without wings. Those words weighed heavy on me for the next several days. They inspired me to create an entire speech based on those words. I asked Congressman Lewis's staff if he may be willing to sit down for an interview to explain more about what was behind those words. Because of his generosity, we sat down and talked for about 30 minutes. As a result of that conversation, we have this interview that I am sharing with you today. Now, I've often referred to Congressman Lewis as a walking monument to the civil rights movement. Sadly, that walking monument walks no more. Congressman John Lewis passed away last evening at the age of 80. It is in his memory and for everything he has contributed to our nation that I am sharing this with you today. It's an honor to be here with you today. Sir. Well, thank you very much. I'm delighted and very pleased to be with you, sir. Absolutely. Are we ready? Yeah. Okay. Could you uh, uh, talk to me a little bit about what music, or talk to me a little bit about uh, your youth growing up and kind of what role music played in your community and in your family? Well, I grew up in rural Alabama, about 50 miles from Montgomery, outside of a little place called Troy. My father had been a sharecropper, a tenant farmer, but in 1944, when I was four years old, and I do remember when I was four, we would be working in the field, picking cotton, gathering peanuts, pulling coin, and I would hear my mother, my father, my sisters and brothers, my uncles and aunts, my grandparents singing, singing songs. And sometimes they all would sing together. Growing up there, I attended church and I would hear people singing singing together on one accord. They were singing what we then call Negro spiritual, but they were also singing hymns, folk music. People were singing songs that lifted them and gave them hope. And I can carry a tune very well, but I listened and I tried to, to sing and it was something so beautiful and so wonderful about the songs. Not just the religious songs, but the pop songs, the blues, jazz, the hymns of the church. And it was this feeling that it was going to be okay, it's going to be all right. Because with music, you felt happy, uh, hopeful, that everything was going to work out. At the end of the day, uh, sometime my father was saying something like, the Ean and Sun is going down. Uh, if a cloud was coming over, like it was going to rain, there were stories singing like, something like, children, let's go home. It's time to go. The thunder, we can hear the thunder. We can see the lightning flashing. And as a child, when they would start singing about, let's go home, I was ready to go home. I grew up with this fear of thunder and lightning. So I didn't want to be out in the field working and I was ready 
to go home. And we were singing songs like Spain, Low Sweet Cherry, coming to carry me home. And as a young student, I got involved in the American Civil Rights Movement. And the songs of protest, a song like We Shall Overcome, that came from old hymn of, of the church. Uh, this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. And we would make up song, like go down, go down into Alabama, tell old George Wallace to let my people go. It was copying the song of the church, go down in Egypt land and tell old Pharaoh to let my people go. Those songs gave us strength, gave us this sense of stick to itness, to never give up, to never give in, to not lose hope. It gave us this sense of courage. And sometimes when we were being beaten, arrested, and thrown in jail, we were saying, sound like amen, amen. Let the children say amen. Let the preachers say amen. And we were saying it. And you would hear these young people, and people not so young, filling the jails. And you can hear our voices just bouncing all around the cells of the jails. I own a bus traveling from Montgomery to Jackson, Mississippi. We were saying, we were improvised, we're gonna take a ride from Montgomery to Jackson. I remember when we were marching from Selma to Montgomery, there was a young man who had a guitar and he started playing a little song, pick him up, laying down all the way from Selma town. Can you, during the Civil Rights Movement, you talk about the, the importance of, of, of music during those times. How do you think that um, the, the music of the day influenced the, the, the population about what was happening with the Civil Rights Movement? The, the, the music helped to lead us because so many of the gifted artists, they were so gifted and so smart, they captured the essence of what the movement was all about. Uh, whether it was someone like Otis Redding, or someone like uh, Aretha Franklin, mm -hmm. writing and singing Chain Chain, um, or whether it was Nina Simone mm -hmm. uh, singing Mississippi, Goddamn. You know, Alabama, such and such a thing. Tennessee, I may not have the words here, but one got me all upset. One make me almost lose my mind. Some of these unbelievable artists, they came to Alabama the evening before we walked into Montgomery the next morning, people were there. Peter, Paul, and Mary, mm -hmm. Joan Baez, Harry Belafonte, and they were singing. And it was the music that lifted us. It was the music that gave us the sense that we had to make it and that we would make it it created this unbelievable sense of family that we were all in this thing together. I was providing a, somewhat of an inspiration or uh, the, the additional uh, strength to carry forward. Music was like uh, food for the soul. It um, said we are one. We can do it.
We will make it. We shall overcome. I know we shall overcome. Deep in my heart, I do believe we shall overcome. We believe that. It gave us courage to push on. And sometimes we were, you couldn't see the other person, but you heard a voice. And so that voice, the words, the music, kept us moving. Maybe you got tired and weary along the way, but the music reached out and grabbed you and helped carry you along. Why do you think um, it's important for our youth today to have music as, as part of their education in school? I think it's so important for uh, our young people. And people at the early grades, but in middle school and high school, uh, to have music. First of all, it creates this sense of oneness. You're one accord, you're singing, and when you sing, you feel good. You can be weary, you can be tired, but you feel good. It lifts you, your spirit, give you hope for the future. It creates a sense of joy, a great deal of happiness. I, I remember on occasion when we were being beaten, arrested, and taken to jail but we could still sing. Then put in a wagon, we could still sing. Or been in, put in a church, or we were in a church during the Freedom Rides in 1961, when people were trying to bomb the church or burn the church, but we continued to sing. Do you think the, in, the opportunity for things like music and arts and other activities uh, are helpful in helping to keep our students in school, even in bringing them into the schools. Oh, I, I think music, the arts, can play a major role, and he is playing a major role in helping to keep our children, our young people uh, in school. It's where people can learn and grow because music and art help young people succeed in other areas of study, whether it's math or science, uh, with music, they will do better, much better. I just have two other questions for you. Actually, one is a question and one is the, the statement you made that you talked about. Um, in that presentation, when you received that award, National Association of Music Merchants. You spoke very eloquently about growing up in Troy uh, and about uh, particularly the, your, your fondness for raising your chickens. Could you talk a little bit about, uh, about that and the things that you enjoyed um, you know, in your youth growing up in Troy? Well, growing up um, in Troy or outside of Troy on, on a farm, I fell in love with raising chickens. I felt like it was my calling. I became very good at raising chicken as a little boy. We, uh, we gather all of our chickens together in the chicken yard. And my brothers and sisters and cousins were lined outside of the chicken yard. And I wanted to be a minister as a little child, about eight, nine years old. And I would preach to these chickens. And when I look back on it, some of these chickens were by their heads. Some of these chickens would shake their heads. They never quite said amen. But I'm convinced that some of those chickens that I preached to during the 40s and the 50s tended to listen to me much better than some of my colleagues listened to me today in the Congress. And some of those chickens were just a little more productive. At least they produced eggs. Uh, Along the way, I, I, I 
I, I, I really tried to baptize some of those chickens. I tried to save them. And by taking them under and bringing them up, it was not a good thing to do. <laughs> but from time to time, even the chickens, in their own innocent ways, especially the hens, they would try to sing. They would try to communicate, especially the young ones. When they were looking for food out in the field, or when they were going to go to a nest to start laying eggs for the first time, they would be singing. Even the chickens had the ability, the capacity to sing a song. That's and you, you, you hear birds. You hear birds during the spring singing. It's, it's like music in the air. It was not just good for human, but it was good for other creatures. Absolutely. It sounds like your, your preaching to your first flock was uh, giving you the uh, experience you needed to, uh, to preach with the flock across the, uh, across the street here in Congress. Well, I, I think the chicken helped prepare me for what I'm doing today. Excellent. Without music, the civil rights movement would have been like a bird without wings. Well, it's Saturday, July 18th, and like the rest of the world, we woke up to the news of the passing of um, legendary Congressman John Lewis, uh, champion of so many things, but a champion also of music and arts education, great friend of NAM and our industry as we worked tirelessly over the past years to ensure that music and art education was an essential part of every school day. Uh, working with Congressman Lewis on the reauthorization of the Every Student Succeeds Act and of course the appropriations in the years past to make sure that the titles one, two, and four, especially those aimed at the most underserved communities, were fully funded. And uh, awarding Congressman Lewis the Support Music Award in 2015 during our DC fly-in was one of the highlights of, of all our lives, of everyone that was there. And uh, his comment that, that night uh, upon accepting the Support Music Award that in his mind the civil rights movement would never have gotten off the ground without music and the music that represented the spirit of, of change. And maybe that's one of the most important aspects of, of how uh, he viewed music, but as a right of every child, he was a defender and a champion. He will be missed.